Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Here is a couple of opening announcements before we get started. Opening announcement number one is, I don't know what's going on with my voice, but I think it's the pollen, the fact that we changed geographic locations, because I feel like all day I've been losing my voice, <clears throat> and it's a little on the raspy side. I'm, determined, I'm, I'm confident that it's... Um, that's what it is. Welcome to the church. So you're gonna have to. <laughs> so you're gonna have to just deal with that. I'm sorry. I got my water bottle. I'll, I, I'm not gonna lose my voice. It just sounds like it's going. Um, the second thing is the booklets are yours to keep. You can write on them, whatever. My wife and I have a rule whenever we eat out, and the rule is throw it away at home. If we ever have anything that is left over food-wise, we always take it home because they're gonna throw it away. Well, you never know if you're going to eat it for a midnight Scooby snack or something, so throw it away at home. So Corey asked me about the booklets. You can do anything you want to with it. Just if you're going to throw it away, throw it away at home. <laughs> I don't want to walk out and find 19 of them in the trash can out there. I think that's it for the announcements. So. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let me have a prayer, and then we will start, and I'll tell you where we're going to go and how we're going to get there. Does that sound good? Father in heaven, we thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for just the fellowship that is the church and the opportunity we have to study and learn from your word and from the history of it. And I pray, Father, that tonight and next couple of nights you'll just bless our time as we look at one of the um, men that was had a big influence upon the church of Jesus Christ. And help us as we study through this. And Lord, that we'll all be blessed, that we'll grow and strengthen in our knowledge of the scriptures, and Lord, be better prepared to serve you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. What we're going to look at tonight is, we're going to, not tonight, the whole time, we're going to go through a study of a document that was one of the most important documents in the Restoration Movement history. <clears throat> and when I was learning how to preach, one of the most important things that I learned was to never overestimate the knowledge of the hearers. You know, the Restoration Movement, I don't, that's a whole other history class, but just this idea that developed in the late 1700s to just get back to the Bible. And there were a number of men in the eastern half of the U.S., and the reason it was the eastern half of the U.S. is there was no western half of the U.S. In the eastern half of the U.S., just kind of all at the same time, looked around at all the denominational stuff and said, why don't we just get back to the Bible? And at the same time, there were also some guys from overseas that had the same thinking. And those guys launched this back to the Bible movement that became known as the Restoration Movement. One of the documents that was produced in that was this document called the Declaration and Address. And we're going to spend the, the, all of our time going through that document. Please don't be nervous because we're going to look at a ton of Bible verses and we'll look at it. And what we're going to do is I'm going to spend 15 or 20 minutes <clears throat> talking a little bit about Thomas Campbell He's the man that wrote it. Then in the Declaration Address, he had 13 propositions. And what we're going to do is we'll spend our time, almost the bulk of our time over tonight and the next couple of days, looking at those 13 propositions. And I think it's important because, first of all, it's, I think knowing history is good. But the other reason why is the principles that he put in place 200 years ago are very valid today. The, principle, the principles that shaped the early Christian church, Church of Christ, they're just as valid today as they were then. And they're just as practical to try to bring people who claim Jesus as Lord together. They're just as practical today as they were when he wrote them. And that's what I hope you get out of this. And learn some history and learn that the value of the principles. I get asked all the time, people think the restoration movement's dying. Well, I don't know if that is or not. But I know this, the principles are valid. And there's a lot of congregations out there that are, that are committed to the principles. And if you're committed to the principles, then the movement's not dead. That's my position. Okay, page one. So Thomas Campbell, he was born in Ireland. 
And as a general rule, I don't like to read to people. There'll, there's some things in here that I'm going to read just so you hear every word. But as a general rule, I don't like to read to people. But he was born in Ireland, and he came to America in 1807. Came to America because he had three things going on. He was preaching a located ministry as a Presbyterian. He was teaching at a school that he had started. And then he was very burdened his whole life, very burdened by the division that he saw. And he was working desperately trying to bring together these disparate Presbyterian groups. Those three events going on simultaneously just broke his health. And the doctors wanted him to go to America. I don't know why. And the doctors said, go to America to get well. And he came to America, never left. And he was raised in the Church of England. But he found in the Church of England, it was very stuffy and very impersonal. And it was just very formal and strict. And he just didn't sense that there was any community there. And this is a comment in passing. You guys are super nice bunch. My wife and I got in the car headed home, and she goes, man, they're a friendly congregation. I said, yeah, they are. So you guys got that going for you. Congratulations, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> you joke, but I'm telling you, I, I preach in places. I've, I've been to places. There are 100 people there, and six people will say hello. I mean, that's the truth. And so you guys are very friendly, and that's much to your credit. Now, he, he became down about the fourth bullet down. He was a Presbyterian, but he was a Presbyterian divided four ways. He was an old light, anti-burger, seceder Presbyterian. Now, remember, he's in Ireland, okay? Those divisions meant something in Scotland. Presbyterian, you know what that is. He was, a, he was a succeeder. That had to do with this thing called lay patronage, and that basically was this. Did a congregation have the right to pick their minister, or did some lay person pick their minister? Well, some thought that the congregation should be able to do it. Some thought that somebody else should be able to do it. They split over that. Then he was an anti-burger. The laws of Scotland required that residents of town swear allegiance to whatever the local religion was. Well, the burger seceders were okay with that. They thought that referred just to Presbyterians, but the anti-burgers thought that they were swearing allegiance to a national church, which they wouldn't do, so they split on that. Then there was old light versus new light, and that had to do with your approach to the Westminster Confession. If you were really strict about that, and didn't want any adherence, I'm mean, sorry, any deviation from that, you were an old light. And if you were okay with a little wishy-washiness, you were a new light. And they split over that. So he was an, he was an old light, anti-burger, succeeder Presbyterian. Those titles had meaning in Scotland. He's in Ireland. And he looks at that and he thinks, what in the world is going on? What are we doing? And that was driving him nuts. Well, he ends up coming to America. And there's, uh, and this, we're kind of at the bottom of page one now. He ends up in America. I'm skipping some of the history because I don't want to talk about Thomas Campbell for 45 minutes. I want to talk about this document. He comes to America and gets in trouble with the Presbyterians. And you're probably thinking to yourself, no surprise. And eventually, they finally kicked him out of the Presbyterians. That's the John Mitchell paraphrase. And... He wasn't sure what to do, but he was already collecting some guys around him that were getting this back to the Bible approach. And they met in a home of a guy named Abraham Alters. And this happened in August of 1809. And there was a group of them there, and basically they had met to try to decide on some principles that they could use to move forward. He knew that the church was not supposed to be divided all these multitude of ways. He knew that wasn't right. And they weren't really sure what to do about it. And he, in that home, home of Abraham Alters, and I'm confident that this was a throwaway line for him. And by throwaway line, I mean it was just something he just said and didn't think anything about it. But while they were there, he made this comment. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. Where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. Well, that became the clarion call of the Restoration Movement. That idea that where the scriptures speak, we speak, and where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. That became the clarion call. And there was a guy there, and 
there was a guy there who he kind of raised his hand and he said, wait a second now. If we do that, that'll be the end of infant baptism. And at this point, everybody's baptizing infants. And the guy raised his hand. He said, well, that, if we do that, then we're done with infant baptism. And Thomas Campbell said, if infant baptism is not in the scriptures, then we're going to have nothing to do with it. And it, it, be, it may sound easy to us, but it was hard for them. You know, they're coming out of this, and it was hard for them. But that principle, where the scriptures speak, we speak, or where the scriptures are silent, we're silent, that became kind of the watchword of the Restoration Movement, and more than probably any of the other slogans became the real framework for who we are and what we do. Then, believe it or not, he wrote this 50-page document over the next month, and when they met the next month, he presented this document called the Direct Declaration and Address. That what it did was it laid down the principles by which the church would go forward. And it, and it boils down to this. It was the authority of scriptures. And their motto was union in truth. That phrase occurs in the Declaration Address several times. Union in truth. <clears throat> he wanted them to be united, but he wanted them to be united around the scriptures. His son, Tom, Alexander Campbell, now more of you have probably heard of him, Alexander Campbell, than you have Thomas Campbell, but Alexander is his son. And Alexander Campbell later would come along, and Alexander Campbell would say this. He said, all that's necessary for the conversion of the world is the union and cooperation of Christians. And all that's needed for the union of the Christians is adherence to the Word of God. Union and truth. And that was, that was their thing. And he did not want to start another creed. He just wanted the scriptures to be it. Now, there's some principles that, were, that drove the Declaration and Address, and they're in the middle of your page there. The first was the divine standard, the authority of scriptures. And he was firmly convinced that everything, had, all of our measures had to be taken directly and immediately from the word. And they were bound to the word, and they were bound to nothing else. The second was responsibility, that the divine word is equally abiding upon all, and everybody has an equal obligation to be bound to it and by it alone. Now, one of the things you have to realize is he was coming out of Calvinism. Almost everybody back in those days were a Calvinist, and that's a time for another study, but one of the things about Calvinism there's not a whole lot of things about Calvinism that are right. But one of the things that was wrong about Calvinism was the idea that God's going to save the elect, and the elect are going to be saved no matter what. And you're saved, you're damned, you're saved, you're damned, you're saved, you're damned. You can't, you can't do anything about it. And these guys came along and said, that's not by biblical. You're responsible to the scriptures. You're responsible to God. Everybody has to make a personal decision. So that responsibility is kind of somewhat in that, that responsibility is sort of, in response to that, I mentioned this morning about how I had multiple thoughts going. My hero of the restoration movement is a guy named Raccoon John Smith. And Raccoon John Smith is my favorite character from restoration movement history. And this idea of Calvinism, you're saved, you're damned, you're saved, you're damned. He, was, he had multiple kids. And he was a real good preacher. And Raccoon John Smith was out on the road preaching. And his wife had a beautiful singing voice. And his wife had a sick friend who was dying. And the sick friend asked his wife to come over and sing for her. And she came over to sing for her friend because the, the lady's going to die pretty soon. Raccoon John Smith's wife is over singing for a friend. Raccoon John Smith's out preaching. House catches on fire. And a son and a daughter died in the house fire. And Raccoon John Smith comes home, and he's a Calvinist at the time. And he couldn't comfort his wife. And he couldn't comfort his wife because he didn't know if his kids were saved or damned. And it bothered him that they might have gone from the fires of the house to the fires of hell, which would have been worse. And he didn't have anything he could say to his wife. He decided to sit down and take out his Bible and figure out how, looking at his scriptures, he could determine if they were saved or lost. And what conclusion did he come to? The whole doctrine was wrong. The whole doctrine was wrong. The whole idea that it's amazing what happens when you pick up your Bible and start looking at it. You know, it's absolutely amazing what happens. I heard a guy say one time, it's amazing how much light the Bible can shed on the commentary. Yeah. 
And anyway, but he, those guys back in that time period, back in the 1800s, they were coming out of this, they were coming out of all this Calvinism and the falsehoods there. The third one was the danger. And that was that no man has a right to judge his brother. Just use the Bible as your standard. And if a person's violating the scriptures, you can judge him. If he's, not, if he's not violating the scriptures, leave him alone. Leave him alone. The third was destruction. He just thought, this, he thought the sectarianism was just evil. He hated the division. And the last, the rest, the peace and calm that's needed among the church is found in Christ and in Christ alone. And those were the principles. When, if you, I wouldn't say that I don't recommend it, but if you want to sit down and read the Declaration and address have at it. It's a pretty long document. It won't take you that long to read it. But if you read through it, those principles will surface. He doesn't have it outlined that way. But if you read through it, you'll see those principles um, surface. So the last thing, when I put both Campbells, I mean Alexander and, and Thomas, both of them. Because what will happen is a few years later, Thomas Campbell will travel over to America also to meet his dad. And it was really interesting. When they met... Both of them were very nervous. Thomas Campbell was very, very nervous because his son is a Presbyterian preacher and he had penned the Declaration and Address. And he was very nervous that his son was, not gonna, was gonna be very upset with him. Alexander Campbell, the son, was very nervous because he was coming to the same conclusions, that this division's no good and that we ought to get back to the Bible. And there, they both had come to the same position, one's in Ireland and one's in America. And, of course, there's no Facebook. You know? There's no iPhone. They're not texting each other. And they had come to the same conclusions an ocean apart. And they were nervous to meet each other because what was the other one going to say? And when they got together and found out that they had come to the same conclusions, it was like a big relief. And Alexander Campbell was much better suited to quote-unquote lead than his father was. And Thomas Campbell, the dad, just passed the mantle over to his son. And Alexander Campbell became the, probably the main voice throughout the 1800s. That wasn't too bad. I was hoping to get through that in 15 or 20 minutes, and we made it. So he turned the page. And what we're going to do now is the, the document has, after some introductory comments, towards the back I've got kind of a layout of exactly how the, the document was laid out. Don't turn back there and try to find it. <clears throat> it has 13 propositions in it. That is the meat. And what I want to do is I want to take some time to go through the 13 propositions and show you what his thinking was and how those propositions are very valid today. And these principles adopted and applied are just as good today to unite us in Christ as they were when they were written. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Is it hot in here or is it just me? Just me? Okay. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't hurt my feelings. I'm just curious. I could take my jacket off. Well, I'll do that. There we go. Oh, that's a lot better. All right. I don't know who said that, but thank you. All right, here we go. Proposition number one. Here's what he writes. That the church of Christ upon earth is essentially, intentionally, and constitutionally one, consisting of all in every place that profess their faith in Christ and obedience to him in all things according to the scriptures, and that manifest the same by their tempers and conduct and of none else, as none else can truly and properly called, can be truly and properly called Christians. So that, that's the first proposition. We're kind of lucky because if you do much write, reading about documents that are written in this time period, whew, that can be hard to understand. But fortunately, he didn't have too bad a language. So here's what he says. It's essentially one. It has to be one to accomplish its, person, its purpose. It's intentionally because God intended it to be one. God intended the church to be one. 
and it is constitutionally one because it only has one rule of faith and practice. The scriptures. So it's essentially one because it needs to be one if it's going to accomplish its purpose. It's intentionally one because that's the way God wants it. And it's constitutionally one because it only has one rule of faith and practice. Then it's comprised of individuals, not congregations. And by congregations, a better word there might be denominations. But it's, it, the church is comprised of individuals, not one group over here believing this and one group over here believing this and one group over here believing this. And only faith in Christ and obedience to him is what can properly be called a Christian. Now, if you have your Bibles, I was going to read some of these. You can always just listen to me or you can keep up or whatever you want to do. But I want to show you that the principles are Bible-based. It wasn't like he just put this thing together in his own mind. Everything he had in here was very scripture oriented John 10, verse 16, Jesus says this, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice. And there'll be one flock and one shepherd. That was Jesus' plan. There'd be one flock and one shepherd. Of course, he's the shepherd. This is in the uh, discourse about how he is the good shepherd. One flock, one shepherd. Then half a dozen verses over, to, or pages over, not verses over, you arrive in John 17. And John 17, verse 20, Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, but those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as you, Father, in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Now, one of the things when you read your Bible in John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, in those five chapters of John, Jesus says a lot of things in those five chapters. And you have to kind of pay attention when you're reading through them. Some of the things in there he says to everybody, and some of the things he says to just the apostles. These couple of verses were said to the apostles. I don't pray for these, these apostles alone, but I pray for those who will believe me through their word those who are going to believe in him through the apostles' word. And why? That they all may be one. Jesus' idea was that there would be one. Now, he knew he was starting a worldwide religion. So there, there was going to be people everywhere. But the idea was that they would be one. Him and the Father united. And he wants the... And the last thing he says in verse 21 is that the world through me, I'm sorry, the world may believe that you sent me. Thomas Campbell, or Alexander Campbell, looked at this, and his thinking about this passage was that the division among the churches makes it very difficult to win people to Christ. And if you've done much evangelism work, you know that's true. Because you start talking to people, it's like, well, they believe this down the street and this over here. and Nobody knows what's right, and they don't want anything to do with it. It makes it very difficult to call, communicate sometimes with people because there's so many ideas out there. Then over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when we're just nailing down this one concept, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, here's what Paul says. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12, he says, starting in verse 12, he says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Three times in, the, in that one verse, he talks about one body. For, we all, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, am I not of the body? It is therefore not of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. 
So Paul is nailing down the same idea about this one body. Now, just for completion's sake, what Paul is doing, they had a trouble in the Corinthian congregation where they were misusing their spiritual gifts. And they were exalting certain gifts over other gifts. And Paul is correcting, when in chapters 12, 13, and 14, he's correcting the, their misuse of gifts. And the way he corrects that is by telling them, wait a second, you guys are one body. You know, the hand doesn't do what the foot does. The ear doesn't do what the eye does. Everybody has its own role, but it's all part of one body. And it's important for everybody to do their own role, not to exalt one over the other. That's Paul's teaching in here. But in the meantime, he emphasizes the fact that there's one body. There's just one body. Then over in Ephesians, <clears throat> Paul says the, basically the same thing. Paul says the, basically the same thing. In chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says, He himself is our peace. That, that's Christ. He himself is our peace, who's made both one, broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, making peace, and that he may reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. He came and preached peace to you who are far off and to, you, and to those who are near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. These verses are fascinating to me. Now, the both in passing is Jew and Gentile. The both there is Jew and Gentile. But this is a fascinating passage that every time I read this, it's just too good to just slough on by. Paul is teaching here something very, very interesting. In verse 14, he says, he is our peace. He's made both one. Now, one, the both is Jew and Gentile, and he made them one. And how did he do that? He broke down the middle wall of separation. Now, that's talking about the law of Moses. The law of Moses, among them, it's one of the most remarkable things ever done was God's law of Moses. Are we doing okay? You got a funny look on your face. Give me some kind of signal if we get off track. You know? <laughs> God's got a nation called Israel. And he's going to use Israel to bring the Christ into the world. Now, God knows this, but Israel doesn't. That's going to take 1,400 years. And since God had promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that through their seed, the Messiah would come, God's got to keep them, Israel, he's got to keep them separate from the rest of the world. And he's got to do that for 1,400 years. That's a long time. One of the things the law of Moses did was the law of Moses erected a barrier between Jew and Gentile that prevented them from being able to fellowship with each other. You know, the Jews ate the Gentiles' gods and vice versa, if that makes sense. You know, they had, you know, they, they had steak and hamburger, the Jews did, and the Gentiles, they worshiped those things. But not only did the law of Moses separate the Israelites from everybody else, the law of Moses also separated the Israelites from themselves. Because not only Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were promised the Messiah, was also promised to come through Judah, who was one of the 12 sons of Israel. God's got to keep Judah separate from everybody else too. Well, how did he do that? He told them where to live. And told them who to marry. And the law of Moses kept the Israelites separate from the Gentiles while keeping the Israelites separate from themselves. Now try that at home. And that's what Paul is saying, though. But now in Christ, that wall of separation is done. And that's what he says in verse 15. He abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments. But why did he do that? So he could create in himself one man from the two. Take the Jew. And, so what God did was he had a wall of separation between the Jews, 
I say Israel, between the Israelites and the Gentiles, between the nation of Israel and everybody else, he had this wall of separation. In Christ, he took that down, brought everybody together in one body, and then in that one body, he's going to reconcile them to God. But the, from Thomas Campbell's standpoint, the focus is on the one body. I just felt like talking about that because I felt like doing it. But don't miss the one body. So that's Proposition 1. Anybody got a question about that? Great. That's Proposition number 1. <clears throat> there we go. Proposition number 2 says this. That although the Church of Christ upon earth must necessarily exist in particular and distinct societies, locally separate from one another, yet... There ought to be no schisms, no uncharitable divisions among them. They ought to receive each other as Christ Jesus has also received them, to the glory of God. And for this purpose, they ought to all walk by the same rule, to mind and speak the same thing, and to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, what this does, it affirms that there will be many local congregations within that one church. The church will necessarily exist in particular and distinct societies. I mean, let's face it. My wife and I attend the Spring County Church of Christ in Middletown, Ohio. That's impractical for you guys. We didn't drive out here. We flew to St. Louis and drove. But it's a two-hour drive to St. Louis. I don't know. Probably, I don't know. It's an eight-hour drive from here home. Boy, we'd be a mess if we had to alternate congregations. Now, you guys come up at our place next week. It's only eight hours. <laughs> we'll see you next week. It's only eight hours, you know. So it's necessarily going to exist in particular and distinct societies. But even though, so the, the church does exist as congregations, i.e. gatherings of people. But though they're distinct and separate, there shouldn't be any division. There shouldn't be any schisms in it. Why? Because they're one. And he says in there, there shouldn't be any uncharitable divisions among them. They ought to receive each other as Christ Jesus received them. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So, fourth bullet down, since they're constitutionally one, it's logical they would be of the same mind and the same judgment. Now, the same mind doesn't mean you're going to think exactly the same thing on everything. We'll get to that later. But, but on, you know, the basic ideas of, that are plainly taught in Scripture, we should be agreeing on. There's going to be, we'll, we'll talk about that before we get done, about some things are harder to understand, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail as we go through. But the basic idea is we ought to have the same basic mind about the things of Christ and have the same judgment. We're making the same, this is wrong, this is right, kind of an idea. And here's some scriptures that point to that. The first one's there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul tells them that very thing. He says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Be no divisions among you. Be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. The Corinthians had this idea. They had their favorite preachers, you know. And I, you almost get the impression that when, you know, they, they liked Apollos, they liked Paul, they liked Cephas. It was, it was like when he preached, I'll come listen, but when other guys preach, I'm going to stay home. That's almost the word picture. Now, a better example of this is over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> in this, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, moreover, brethren... We make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in all diligence, 
and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but I'm testi- testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Now, what Paul's referring to here is they had some issues where he was, and another congregation somewhere else took up an offering and sent it to him, even though they were in poverty. And the word picture is that the other congregation over there heard this other congregation had a need, and they thought, hey, we're part of them, they're part of us, we're all one church, we ought to support them. Let's take up an offering and send it to them. It wasn't any of this, well, you know, it's their own fault, they shouldn't have done what they did. No. They didn't have that attitude. They were willing to join in together. And what Paul is testing them, when he says this, I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others, well, they had made some promises too. And Paul, if you read the rest of the letter, they had made some promises, and Paul is saying, hey, you guys need to do like them. You promised this other congregation you would help them, help them. Why? Because they're one. And because they're one, there shouldn't be any schisms or division among them. They should be able to join forces and support one another. Then over in a few pages over to Philippians chapter 4, you see a similar thing. And in um, Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. He says, Not that I speak in regard to need. I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I've learned to be both full and to be hungry, to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds on your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I'm full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Kind of the same idea. He had needs, and they were willing to fill them. They took up offerings and sent them. You guys got a thing out there on the wall with all the missionaries. That's what you guys are doing. You got missionaries in, I didn't remember all the countries, but I know there's Africa and a couple others, and you're doing the same thing. They got that church in Africa, and you guys are uniting with them. You take up an offering, send it to them, they, they have needs. And what, that's what Paul is doing here. He's thanking them because they recognize their one body. And you probably have never thought about it this way, but those six or eight missionary families that were in the bulletin and you've got up there on the wall up there, you're applying this principle. You probably never thought about it that way, but you're applying this principle that we're, even though we're in distinct societies, you're here in Missouri and they're in Africa, one's in Mexico, I can't remember where the rest of them are, and we're not, we're, we're locally separate from one another, but there shouldn't be any schisms because we're one. So way to go again. That's two way to goes in one night. <laughs> and that is proposition number two. So, you know, proposition number one is, we talked about that, and proposition number two is there shouldn't be any schisms among the body. Any questions on that? All right, my goal was to get through at least three of these. We might do four, but we'll get through at least three. I was going to go for an hour or so. An hour's hard to think, listen for more than an hour, but you guys are doing good. I can tell by looking. One of the, you can, you can laugh about that if you want to. I didn't know this was going, there's two things that I didn't know was going to happen when I got into the preaching ministry. The first thing I didn't know is how well you learn how to read faces. Because I can tell when I'm standing up here who's keeping up and who's not. That's why I asked my wife the difference if she's over there with this peculiar look on her face. <laughs> you kind of, you can learn how to read faces when people are engaged or not and if they're keeping up or not. And I can tell when I'm explaining something, I get a lot of deer in the headlights look. I know I'm about to regroup and try again. But the other thing I didn't realize is all the activity that takes place out there. Isn't that right, Jeff? 
It's amazing when you're standing up preaching how much activity goes on out there. And it can be distracting, but you learn how to deal with it. So, But you guys are doing great tonight, and I hope I am too. And thank you again once again, whoever that was, and told me to take my coat off. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. All right, here we go. Proposition number three. That in order to do this, <clears throat> nothing ought to be inculcated. And I didn't want to insult anybody, but I stuck the definition of that down there in the footnotes. It means to instill by persistent instruction. To instill by persistent instruction. So we'll start over. To do this, nothing ought to be inculcated. Nothing ought to be instilled by steady instruction upon Christians as articles of faith, nor required of them as terms of communion, but what is expressly taught and enjoined upon them in the Word of God. Nor ought anything to be admitted as of divine obligation in their church constitution and managements, but what is expressly enjoined by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles upon the New Testament church, either in expressed terms or approved precedent. Now this is, uh, you know, he's starting to get, he's getting some good momentum going now. Now, you know, he starts the sentence by saying, in order to do this. Well, in order to do what? In order to do proposition number two. In order to make sure that there's no schisms, that there's no uncharitable divisions, that everybody would receive each other, that they would be of the same mind, follow the same judgment. In order to have that level of unification and that level of cohesiveness, in order for that to be a reality, what we need to do is make sure that we don't drill into anybody. You know, by persistent instruction, anything up, upon Christians or anything that's required to be a, a group of, in the same communion, but things that are expressly taught in the Word of God. If it's not expressly taught, then we're not going to admit that as if it's of a divine obligation. Does that make sense? If we're going to be united, then we have to be united upon the things that are in the Word. And we're not going to, what we're going to teach people day in and day out is what's in the Word of God. And then what we're going to require as terms of communion are the things that are expressly taught in the Word. And if they're not expressly taught in the Word, we're not going to make that a term of communion. That's what he's saying. The third bullet down on top, page four there, is the authority of the Bible alone for the church. Nothing is to be made essential to the Christian identity or the fellowship unless it's clearly stated as such in the New Testament. And the next bullet kind of resets the same thing. Only what is expressly taught in the Bible is going to be used for a test of faith and test of fellowship. Nothing else. Let me see if I've got something in here. Okay. I, had, I wanted to make sure I had something coming up in a couple of days, but we might do it tonight. We might do it again in a couple of nights. So John 17, 17, we didn't read that verse, but you probably know what that says about me reading it. But John 17, 17 is where Jesus says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. How we set apart how we made holy, how we made special for him, by his truth. And what is the truth? The word. Your word is truth. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says the same thing. It says that this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual morality. But the, what is the will of God? Your sanctification. So what does God want for you to do? God wants you to be sanctified, set apart, that, the word sanctification comes from a word family, means separation. And by further extension, it's separated for holy use, separated for divine use. How are you separated for divine use? By the word of God. And if we teach the word of God, and the only thing we require is the word of God, then we will accomplish God's will, because that's the will of God, your sanctification. 
Now, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is Colossians chapter 2, the first 10 verses. This is one of my favorite passages. And Paul says here, he says, I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that the hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Now notice what he says in verse 3. In verse 3 he says this. Oh, by the way, I meant to say this earlier. I read from the New King James Version, in case you're wondering. And I told you, I, I've told you guys this morning about my math thing, my, me and my calculus and my friend. And, and I like to say that I use the New King James Version because that's what Paul used. And I got another friend who he fires back at me. He uses the New American Standard because that's what Peter used. So. <laughs> but I like the New King James Version because that's what Paul used. So. Verse 3, talking about Christ, Paul says this, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I remember what we're talking about is nothing ought to be taught persistently, consistently to people, but what's in the word of God. And nothing ought to be a test of faith or a test of communion or a test of fellowship except for what is expressly taught. And Paul comes along and says, in Christ are all the hidden treasures, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now I say this, not me, Paul says, now I say this lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Now, those verses are interesting. Paul says all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Now, wisdom in the Bible is having the skill necessary to negotiate the complexities of life. Let's face it, life is hard. And life has a lot of challenges between your family and job and well, the kids aren't that hard, but let's face it, they can be a little, you know, they can be finicky at times. But life is challenging and life is hard. And the, the skill to negotiate life is wisdom. And what Paul is saying is the treasures of wisdom, what's needed to negotiate life is in the Word of God. If you understand the Word, then you'll know how to navigate and negotiate life. Now, I can get on my official soapbox on this, but just think about where we are in the country right now, how far we are from the Word of God, and how's that working out for us? I mean, how's that working out for us? You, the further you get from the Word of God, the less skill you have to negotiate life. And we're seeing that. And Paul says that. He goes, I'm not with you guys, but I'm with you in spirit. And I'm happy. That's John's word. I'm rejoicing because, you know, you're, you're ordered. You're steadfast. And then he gets down to verse 7. He says, you're rooted and built up as you have been taught. Christianity is a taught religion. Now, all that's fine and good. But then verse 7, verse 8, he says this, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, the word cheat has the idea of being taken captive, being held hostage. And Paul's warning them. He says, if you listen to the philosophies of the world, beware, because you're thinking cheat as in being robbed, but the word really has the idea of being taken hostage, being held captive. And I look out at our culture, and there's a lot of people out there in that very situation. And what are they doing? They're following the tradition of men, the principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Because in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. 
Now, that's related to what we're talking about is Thomas Campbell says nothing should be a test of fellowship. Nothing should be a test of faith, but what is expressly taught in the Word. And you read this Colossians passage, you would think, why would you teach anything else? Why would you teach anything else? Because the Word of God has everything you need. So don't teach anything else. Teach the Word of God. And one more passage is over in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. This is one more sufficiency of the Word passage. Oh, you guys aren't cold now, are you? Because I'm super comfortable now. <laughs> You're cold? You want my coat? <laughs> That'll warm you right up. Peter starts out the second epistle. He says this. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who obtain like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of our God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, i got three things to say about this. Oh, we're gonna, this is going to work out great. Three things. Notice verse 3. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, what's the word all mean? All means all. Everything needed for life and godliness is in his word. And that kind of comes back to what I've been saying. There's, we, nothing should be a test of fellowship of what's in the word, but there's no reason to teach anything else. The second thing is down in verse 4 where he says that, having, that we could be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Through the word and through the things that are taught in the word, we can escape all the pollution that's in the world. Now, here comes the third thing. And this is kind of a tease for tomorrow night. In the verse there where he says, His divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, who called us through the glory and virtue, by which it has been given to us exceedingly great promises. Here's my question for you. Who's us? Now this is a setup, not a setup, but this is kind of a prelude of tomorrow. How many think us is all Christians? How many, think, how many think us is just the apostles? Well, look at the passage again. It says, His divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which has been given to us exceedingly great promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. If us was everybody, why didn't he say through that through these we may be partakers of the divine promises? And then also, grace and peace, his divine power has given us all things type in line. Who was promised that all things would be revealed to them? Us or the apostles? The apostles. Who was given the great and Exceedingly promises. Well, they were. They delivered them to us. And here's my point. There are people who think that us, there's the apostles. And there are people who think us, there's every, all Christians. Can you really tell? The answer is no. No, you can't really tell. There's not enough hints in the passage to really definitively determine which one is which. Are we going to make that a test of fellowship? No. Is that expressly taught? No, that's not expressly taught. And what we're going to see tomorrow in one of the other propositions is 
don't make your interpretations test of fellowship. And we're going to look at a couple passages tomorrow where there are two or three reasonable interpretations of scriptures that are not the same. Now, is Jesus the Christ? Say yes. <laughs> that is a test of fellowship. Is the blood atonement real? That is another question that yes. Someone comes along and, you know, like certain denominational groups have taken blood out of their hymn books. That's no good. Is God, I mean, is he holy? Yes. Are the scriptures inspired? Yes. Did Jesus bodily raise from the grave? Yes. Those things are test of fellowship because they are expressly taught. Is us there the apostles or all of us? Huh? There's good arguments on both sides. Are we going to make that test of fellowship? No. So when the Christian church 20 miles down the road invites you guys down there, don't say, you know, th those guys in that Peter passage think that's the apostles. I know that's us. I'm not going down there. <laughs> Does that make sense? But when the church 20 miles down the road comes back and tells you, well, yeah, th there are errors in the Bible. It's not really infallible. Get nervous. Yeah, so what will become a test of fellowship and what's a test of communion is what is expressly taught. And we'll look tomorrow night at how you handle when things, when there are things are a matter of interpretation because he addresses that too. Because let's face it, Peter says that Paul writes about things and then Paul, Peter writes this about Paul of some things which are hard to understand. You know, Paul wrote some things that are hard to understand. He's not the only one, by the way. But there are things that are hard to understand. And on those things that are hard to understand, there's going to be some things we're going to disagree on interpretation-wise. And Thomas Campbell will address that, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. That was an hour's worth. Did it go fast to you guys? That went fast to me. So-so? Yeah. What can we have done to make it faster? Okay. Anybody have any questions about that third proposition? And I hope you can see where the principles, even though they were written over 200 years ago, the three principles, I hope that's nothing bad. That's another thing I've learned to do is totally ignore those kind of things. because you, you don't want to embarrass anybody, but you were making such a funny face, I felt like I was okay to say something. The church is one, but even though it's one, it's going to exist in distinct societies, and what becomes a test of fellowship is that we rally around the things that are expressly taught, and you didn't think about it, but that's why I came out here from Cincinnati, and you guys didn't mind me coming, because we're part of one church. We attend the Spring Hill Church of Christ in Middletown, Ohio. We got a real good congregation. If you're up that way, come up and see us. You guys ever been to the Ark Encounter or to the Creation Museum? Well, if you come back again, come to church with us on a Sunday. And then um, the last thing is what becomes a test of fellowship is the things that are expressly taught. For those of you who have been to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum, over the next couple of days, Either tell me or tell my wife which one you think is better. Because that's a common dinner conversation that me and Renee and my daughter's name is Madison. We, we'll sit around during dinner and we'll start talking about that. Which was better, the Ark Encounter or the Creation Museum? And we don't know. We don't make that test of fellowship in my house. <laughs> we have, and this is not an exaggeration, my, wife, my daughter and I have ice cream every night, 365 days a year. I mean, we have ice cream every night at our house. And you get ice cream no matter what you think about which one of those is better. <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. Is it school night for you, young fellas? Sadly, yes. Sadly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we see all the families back tomorrow night. I think we're doing the same thing tomorrow, mill at five.
What's for supper tomorrow? Grilled cheese sandwiches or? Oh, there's a possibility. <laughs> and then we're having, I'll cook it, you know. I love grilled cheese, by the way. And then, um, and we're here at 6 tomorrow. So same program tomorrow, as they would say back in my day, same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs> Five o'clock. What's that? That's okay. Well, it seems like everybody enjoyed themselves tonight. I did too. See everybody tomorrow for dinner at 5, and then we'll be back here again tomorrow. We'll pick up where we left off for Proposition 4. Meanwhile, let's close with prayer. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you again for the time tonight. It's fun to laugh in the church, and it's fun the fellowship we have with each other. And I pray, Father, that the things we've talked about in your word tonight have resonated with us and that we're growing in our commitment to be the one church. And Lord, that we're getting motivated for those that we know around us that we can encourage to come out of wherever they are and just be part of the one church committed to the simple truths they're taught in your word. And I pray, Father, as we continue to go over the next couple of days, that you'll continue to bless us in our studies. Pray, Father, for the young people that they'll enjoy their school time tomorrow. Pray for my wife and the women in the morning that they'll be blessed from their time together. And that we're all just in just continue to enjoy the life and the fellowship that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.